Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. So I want to tell you about how we can use quantum entanglement in order to do some kind of practical tasks we might be interested in. And I will start by listing some general applications and then proceed to talk a little bit in a little bit more detail about some specific application, which is actually quite closely related um, to, uh, to the previous talk we just saw here, but we will be in a little bit more paranoid setting where we don't trust the devices we are using, right? So we are doing some measurements, but we don't know what precisely those measurements are. All right, so we know that entanglement is central to quantum mechanics, and the interesting thing about it is uh, if you have two entangled particles, um, then and one of those experiences certain effects, then these effects are immediately felt uh, by the other entangled part. And here it doesn't matter how far these two particles are. Right, well, um, uh, although this is quite surprising, it doesn't let you communicate. However, what you can do uh, is you can use this effect in order to correlate the behaviors of some distant agents. And in particular, the correlations we can achieve are stronger than the ones we could get by classical means. So now this is all very interesting from kind of fundamental science point of view, but it turns out we can use it to do numerous things. So for instance, um, we can use quantum entanglement to gain improvement when it comes to communication. Uh, for example, uh, we can replace quantum communication with classical one if uh, the sender and the receiver share quantum entanglement. And this is, uh, of course, the famous quantum teleportation protocol. We can also double capacities of uh, classical capacity of quantum channels. Um, and uh, we can also do things like increase uh, the zero error capacity. So here, uh, Alice is looking to send some information over to Paul. Uh, and uh, this information is classical. She has a classical channel available to her. But this classical channel is noisy. And she would like to code her information so that the Bob can decode with zero chance of error. OK, so what we see here, basically, is that quantum entanglement lets you either use your channels uh, that you have more efficiently, or it lets you replace some kind of more expensive communication with a cheaper one. And the next big application of quantum entanglement I want to, do, uh, want to mention is uh, to the uh, setting of device-independent uh, cryptography. Okay, so here, maybe you want to run some uh, cryptographic protocol, and in order to do so, you need to use some devices. But you bought these devices from somebody you do not fully trust. So what quantum entanglement allows you to do in certain cases is to kind of safeguard your information from these potentially malicious devices. All right. So what I want to tell you now about in more detail is how we can verify the dimensionality of quantum systems. Okay, so um, maybe you want to prove to somebody um, that the state that you have in your lab is indeed high dimensional. Okay? And uh, this other person is not willing to trust that. So here I'm looking at a setting where this other person would not be willing to trust that you know precisely which measurements you're doing. Okay, so um, here is the situation um, in, a, in a form of cartoon. So imagine it's year 2050 and Charlie is going to work. Now he wants to buy some uh, entanglement and he uh, luckily passes by this uh, vendor who claims to sell entanglement very cheaply. So he says only 50 cents per dimension. Now Charlie is kind of interested, uh, the price is good, but he has never bought entanglement from this particular vendor, so he's somewhat suspicious. Now what the, uh, the vendor says is, well, don't worry, I'm also going to sell you a dimension testing device. So you're going to use this state. Um, you brought from me, put in this device, and the device is going to tell you what dimension it is. Um, well, of course, the problem is that if Charlie didn't trust uh, the vendor to sell him legitimate high-dimensional entanglement, why should he trust this dodgy device uh, that he also wants to sell? Now, what uh, Charlie would like to do uh, is to sort of have some way of making sure that these states are indeed high-dimensional without having the need to trust any quantum devices. Right, so, and here this device independent setting comes to our aid. 
So uh, the particular scenario I'm going to be looking at is where we will have Alice and Bob, and we will have some way to ensure that they do not communicate. And then we will uh, give uh, Alice some uh, input, S, and Bob some input, T, and they will produce some outputs. And we, what we will observe will be these probabilities. Um, so the probability that given these questions S and T, um, Alice and Bob provide answers A and B respectively. And in particular, we do not want to make any assumptions whatsoever about what, is, what kind of measurements Alice and Bob are doing precisely, right? We don't know what they are doing. Uh, the two assumptions that we are going to make though is, so first, uh, that Alice and Bob cannot communicate. That's why I put the wall between them. Um, and uh, the second assumption is that quantum mechanics is valid. So maybe we do not know what kind of uh, entangled state Alice and Bob might be sharing or what kind of measurements they are doing, but we know that quantum, there is some valid quantum mechanical description of what they're doing. So we are not like totally, totally paranoid. We don't think that you know, nature is described by some kind of um, uh, theory we do not know. All right, and then what we would like to say is statement of the following four, that given this classical data that we have observed, the only way for Alice and Bob to produce this data is if the dimension uh, of the state that they shared, so that they perform some measurements on the state which has dimension at least some time. Right, so uh, now this was first formalized uh, in a work by Brunner and others, um, and they proposed this um, notion of dimension witness. In particular, they looked at Bell-based um, dimensional uh, witnesses. So such a witness would simply be a linear function of W, so your Bell inequality. Now, if uh, your correlation uh, achieves a Bell violation beta, then you can be sure that uh, the state needed to produce it had dimension at least uh, d. So, and here I'm talking about the local dimension. So, this state psi would be living in dimension c d tensor c d. Okay, and but of course, it doesn't need to be a linear functional. And in general, you might be doing some kind of more complicated, uh, taking some more complicated function of this observed correlation p, or just have some more complicated criteria. And the basic idea behind this dimension witness is uh, that there's some kind of translation of this abstract co concept of Hilbert space dimension of, into something which you can observe, um, uh, which you can measure, which you can observe in your lab, and in particular without having the need to trust any devices. Okay, so in my opinion, all the dimension witnesses that we know so far fall into one of the two, uh, one of the two ca categories. So the first ones are some specific examples of dimension witnesses, uh, so based on some specific Bell inequality, and therefore they allow us uh, to test for some specific dimensions. Um, now the good thing uh, for uh, this uh, class of examples is that usually because you're analyzing a very specific Bell inequality, it allow, uh, you can make your analysis pretty tight. Um, so uh, there are several examples here. I just want to mention one. Uh, for instance, um, the C CGLMP inequality with, uh, with two uh, measurement settings and four answers uh, has been experimentally shown uh, to certify dimension four at least four. All right, now, um, of course, the limitation is that we can only test some specific dimensions. And now this is addressed in um, the second uh, class of uh, examples. And here I know uh, of only actually two such results. So here we are looking uh, to find some kind of family of dimension witnesses, which would allow us to test for arbitrarily high dimensions. What I want to show you is a result of the second type. Uh, in particular, I will uh, show you a family of d-dimensional uh, witnesses where this uh, linear functional or Bell inequality, which we are checking, actually is independent uh, of d. So all that's going to change is uh, this violation beta d. 
and perhaps it's uh, useful in some experimental setups if it, co if it would say correspond to you not having to change your experimental setup to test for higher dimensions. All right, so um, before, in order to get my uh, dimension witnesses, I will uh, show you a, a challenge first. Okay, so we have Alice and Bob. Again, we are not letting them communicate. We are gonna ask Alice one out of two questions and the same for Bob. So we are gonna ask Alice A or A prime and Bob B or B prime. And they will answer with bits. Some little A and B. Okay, so and now we're gonna say the following. Okay, Alice and Bob, like if we ask you the unprimed questions, so A for Alice, B for Bob, and you both say zero, in that case, uh, I'm gonna give you $1,000, okay? Uh, however, in certain cases, some bad things might happen, right? In particular, um, if uh, Alice and Bob both say zero, when I ask one of them the prime question and the other one the unprimed question, then they have to go to jail. Also, if I ask both of you the unprimed questions and you both say one, you will go to jail as well. Okay, now the question is, um, is it like if, if I challenge you and your friend, would you play? Would you accept this challenge? So, and I'm proceeding from the assumption that you wouldn't mind winning the prize, but then on the other hand, you really don't want to go to jail. Okay, so let's first uh, look at the case where Alice and Bob are classical, so sort of no quantum entanglement or things like that, right? So let's suppose there is some good strategy. So good meaning that there is a non-zero chance to win the prize, but zero chance of going to jail. Um, so it's not too hard to see that if there is a good strategy, actually you can make it deterministic. So Alice and Bob, uh, their answers only depend on which question they get, so A or B. So if there is such a strategy and they want to win, um, then actually when we ask them questions A and B, Alice and Bob both have to say zero, because that's the only way they can win the prize. All right, good. But, so now both Alice and Bob know that if they are asked the unprimed question, they will say zero. Okay, but now Alice thinks about it and says, okay, well I know if Bob is asked, uh, A, he's gonna, gonna answer with zero. So if I get asked A prime, I should not say zero because that would cause us going to jail. So Alice is gonna say one on question A prime. Okay, now similarly, we can say that Bob should answer uh, one on question B prime. Okay, okay, and now is the problem, right? That if we ask both of them the prime questions, A prime and B prime, then uh, they will end up going to jail. So if you're classical, you should not accept this challenge. All right, however, what Lucian Hardy observed is that if Alice and Bob can share entanglement, actually just two qubits, uh, then they should accept. Okay, and there's another caveat that I'm um, I'm assuming is that their experimental devices are perfect. If your experimental devices are not perfect, of course there's some chance that you would have to go to jail. All right. And the uh, quantum strategy that Hardy proposed was actually uh, very simple. So you could, Alice and Bob could pre-share any one of uh, this family of two qubit states um, where theta varies uh, strictly, so theta is strictly between zero and pi over two. And then, uh, depending on the question that the party uh, that you get, you simply either measure in the standard <coughs> basis if you got, got the prime question, or you measure in this uh, basis, which is rotated uh, by uh, angle of theta, if you got the unprime question. Right? Then it's uh, easy to check that uh, this strategy ensures that Alice and Bob, as long as their experimental devices are perfect, uh, they don't have to fear going to jail. However, there's still a non-zero chance that they will win the prize. Okay, and uh, of course we could optimize their chances of winning by sort of optimizing this data. All right, but now uh, with this one, we cannot test arbitrarily high dimensions because Alice and Bob already could do as well as they can simply by using uh, two qubits. Okay. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna define a more complicated scenario which is gonna allow us to test for arbitrarily high dimension. So again, we have our Alice and Bob. The questions are the same, A and A prime for Alice, B and B prime or B prime for Bob. 
But now instead of answering with bits, they will be allowed to answer with bit strings, okay, of any finite uh, length. And uh, the rules of the, our new challenge or game are going to be the following ones. So we are simply going to take Alice's and Bob's uh, answer bit strings, and we're going to going to compare them sort of bit by bit. Right? And uh, in order to win, they need to satisfy these two conditions. So they want to avoid the red events, uh, so the conditions which corresponded to uh, the red uh, them going to jail um, in the previous uh, challenge in all of the positions of their bit strings. And uh, they need, want to produce the green event in at least one of the positions. I think it's easiest to uh, understand on an example. So for instance, if we ask Alice A and Bob B prime, and they give these two answers, so now the only relevant, uh, the only sort of constraint <coughs> for them uh, was that, um, so it was A for Al, B prime for Bob. The only thing they wanted to avoid is that both of them answer with zero. So we check the first bit, not both of them they say zero. Same for the second, but now there's a problem with the last one. Both of them say zero, so they would lose this. This is not a good answer. However, uh, this, uh, these two bit strings uh, would win because uh, Alice and Bob uh, don't both say zero on any one particular position. Okay, now if we ask them uh, inputs A and B, then we wanted to produce the green event, which corresponds to them uh, both saying zero, zero in at least one position. And we see that they would win because both of them answer zero <coughs> on the very last position, so on the <coughs> third position. Okay, so now um, how can Alice and Bob perform this task? Well, I'm going to show you some specific uh, strategy that they could use. Actually, we could just uh, try to use build a party strategy. Right, so uh, for every n, we're going to have one strategy. Alice and Bob are going to share n copies of this state site data. And uh, depending on which input they got, so the primed or the unprimed one, they measure all of the copies with the same measurement, so m or m prime. And it is easy to see um, that uh, this uh, strategy, and, and the answer is just going to be the string of outcomes. Okay, it is easy to see that this strategy succeeds uh, with probability with, which uh, goes to one exponentially fast in n. Right, so now what we can say that, uh, the first observation is that, well, uh, quantum players can succeed at Hardy's game, at this game we saw, uh, with prob probability arbitrarily close to one. And in particular, these strategies that we saw, um, they have the property that if we want to succeed with higher probability, we have to pre-share more copies of this state psi theta. But of course, what could happen is that well, maybe we just maybe this is not the best thing they can do. Maybe there's some other strategy which would allow them to succeed with high probability, even when they use low dimensional state. But what we were able to show was that this is not the case. No matter how smart you are, no matter what strategy you could conceive, as long as uh, you, you uh, succeed at this game H with probability 1 minus epsilon, you need to be using some state whose dimension scales like 1 over uh, square root of epsilon. Okay, so um, now we can go back to our starting cartoon. Um, so the idea is Charlie wanted to be sure that the state um, that he's buying is indeed high dimensional. What he could do is he could challenge the vendor and vendor's companion to some rounds of this Hardy's game H. Now, if he would observe that they succeed with very high uh, success probability, then he could be reasonably sure that the state that they were using is indeed high dimensional. So this was all I wanted to tell you about today. Thank you very much. So, so you share the same state, multiple mm -hmm. multiple copies of the same state, yeah. and you perform 
the same measurements on each? On, on all the copies you on have. On all the copies. Um, because there's this idea of to get a, a, a green outcome, a win, you needed to have a particular pair of measurements. Right? So so when you were mentioning before you had A B you you needed A B yeah. in order to get to get to it. I mean if you had A B dash you could only not lose, kind of, rather yes, than getting yes, yeah. a green. So Yeah, so what what, what is basically happening that um, every time you perform this measurement you have some chance of winning the prize. Right? But you repeat this measurement many times and you just need to win once. Well, if I try to do something n times and every time I have uh, the probability of succeeding is p, well, the probability that I succeed at least once is going to be like 1 minus p to the n, where n is the number of times I tried. The, the thing that confused me is that there were, there were some measurement pairs yeah. where you, you can't get a green outcome at all, right? So you Yes. So, so I don't quite understand what measurements you're repeating and when, when you switch up measurements, if ever, or... So you, you are asked some questions. Yes. Maybe you don't know ahead of time which questions you will be asked. Now, if I ask you uh, these unprimed questions A and B, and you both say zero, then I give you the prize. But I could also ask one of you A and the other guy ask B prime. And now certain bad things can happen. And you would like to avoid that. Okay. We, we can... Yeah, we can talk. Yeah, sure. right, thank you. Um, so, um, in order to get a, um, in order to estimate a success probability, um, you presumably have to impose some kind of probability on like um, which questions are being asked. So, uh, is it's like the probability uniform that like? Yes, you know, yes, I have a probability distribution over questions. I'm assuming it's uniform. Okay. Any more questions before I ask Ashley? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. no. It's a nice picture at the end of the you know, entanglement vendor and wanting to, to check whether he's, he's real or not. But yeah. I guess we need two vendors, right? Yes. I mean, is there, is there any sense in which any of these questions make sense if you only have you know, one vendor? I mean, maybe it's not entanglement, but it's some other direction. To so do, you, do you always need two? So it seems like if we are working in this very paranoid scenario, where we don't trust what we are doing, I think it, it's hard for me to imagine that we can do with just one party. If you know something about what you're doing, then yes. Okay, let's thank uh, Laura and all of the speakers this morning again.